Welcome everybody for this uh, webinar, um, uh, which is organized by the Elephant. My name is Patrick Kadara, and I am the um, curator in chief uh, for the Elephant, which is an online platform for um, reimagining um, the issues that are affecting both Kenya and the region, um, uh, and thinking about how we can do better, both as a society um, uh, 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 and as a people. Um, uh, this discussion is part of a series that we are doing, um, uh, looking and focusing on the BBI judgment um, that was passed in March um, and to, uh, in May, I think. Um, uh, and the purpose is to interrogate what it means um, uh, for Kenyans. So um, this is the third in the series that we are doing. We've done one that um, uh, started off uh, uh, looking at the, what the judgment had said and what um, uh, the actual implications of it were from a legal perspective. We've done uh, a second one that was looking at um, uh, what the youth think about uh, uh, the constitution. And now this third one, we are bringing in um, uh, civil society people um, to talk about basically what the politics of the BBI is, what it means for us, and to go beyond even the judgment and to ask about the changing of the constitution and under what circumstances should we do it? Does it actually need to be changed or is it perfect the way it is? Um, joining us today, oh, by the way, before I go there, um, uh, you can see the recordings for the past two uh, our webinars uh, on our website, uh, um, www.theelephant.info. Um, if you go there and you check under videos, you should be able to find uh, the full recordings of the two webinars that we've already done. Um, I have to mention that we're doing this with the help of the Heinrich Boll Foundation, who are providing the resources for us to be able to put uh, forward these discussions. Um, joining us today is uh, Daria Sokola, who is a writer and researcher um, uh, who works with the elephant. He writes um, quite a, a, a bit on the economics of things and on the politics of what's happening. Um, uh, we are also joined by um, Dr. Mordecai Ogada, um, uh, who's a conservation ecologist, um, uh, a conservation writer, a carnivore ecologist, he calls himself. <laughs> I hope he will explain what that is. Um, uh, and also a public intellectual. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, Daisy Amdani, which, uh, who I'm sure is known to most of you. She's executive director of Crown Trust and a woman's rights practitioners. Um, welcome all of you to, uh, uh, for this. And uh, without further ado, I think we'll just jump into it. Um, in the first session, the uh, first hour, we'll be having a discussion amongst uh, uh, myself and the panelists um, on this. And in the second hour, we'll be able to take in your questions, which you can put in via the chat function at the, um, uh, or the Q&A one. Um, uh, and, 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 and we'll get to those and post them to the, uh, uh, to the panelists as we go along. Right. Um, Daisy, let me start with you. What did you make of the BBI judgment uh, that was passed? What do you think um, uh, it affirms about our constitution? And do you think it's a good thing? Thank you, um, Patrick. And good afternoon to everyone participating. I think that for me, the BBI judgment, it was a landmark ruling. I say I also say it was also prophetic um, in the sense that uh, Kenya is on a journey, a journey towards a more democratic, a more equal society. And this journey began uh, 20 years before the 2010 constitution was promulgated. And the promulgation of the constitution really marked now uh, uh, um, an affirmation of the desires of Kenya, Kenyans, Kenyan citizens over the years. So the courts, what the courts essentially did by that uh, judgment was to affirm and reaffirm the aspirations of Kenyans as captured in the constitution 2010. But what it also did is that it has put power in check because when we look at how um, the, the leadership has behaved in this country since independence, um, they really have not, um, honored the struggle of Kenya, of, of the Kenyan citizen, 
remember that before independence, <clears throat> excuse me, we had uh, the colonialists, the colonial rule for mm -hmm. whom, against whom Kenyan citizens fought. And they fought for the right to self-determination, to determine their own affairs, to govern themselves. That's what they were fighting for. And so at independence, there was a celebration that, you know, finally we're there. But what happened is that it seems, and it became clear over a period of time that one oppressor had been exchanged for another, another who looks like us um, and speaks our language. And they went about dismantling the entire constitutional order so that the independence constitution, by the time we were promulgating it, was in tatters. Tatters not because it was being uh, amended to serve the interests of the Kenyan people, but to consolidate power to a few people and to escape accountability in leadership, transparency and accountability in the management of the nation and its resources. Now, that's what the new constitutional order is seeking to reverse. And if you look at the manner in which the BBI, the proponents of the BBI and drivers of the BBI have gone about it, and you read Kenya's history, and unfortunately for us in Kenya, we are not taught our history. So you would have to go to now um, books written by foreigners who tell us about how we got to where we were in the post-independence constitution. And one of the books I always tell people I think they should read is a book by Daniel Branch, Kenya, uh, Between Hope and Despair, 1963 to 2011. And it's a very interesting book because when you look at uh, the, the detail of how the constitution was amended and how the powers at that time, the leadership at that time consolidated the power, how they dismantled federalism, the Jimbos, the Senate, the um, multi-party democracy. It is akin to, it is exactly what is happening right now. So the BBI is really um, a replay of our historical past. And so I believe that what, I mean, for me, what the judges have done with the, the ruling BBI ruling, which is currently under appeal, is that they have affirmed Kenya's right and desire to move forward with mm -hmm. that, their aspirations as captured in the 2010 constitution. So it's a good thing, a very yeah. good thing. Um, Mordecai, if I may ask you, um, in terms of what it is, the argument has been made by proponents of BBI that actually the constitution was just a deal between politicians had really nothing to do with Kenyans and Kenyans were added on later on to kind of legitimize it. Um, uh, what do you think of the judgment in that context? And also for your specific field um, uh, uh, within conservation, you know, what, what stake do you guys have in the BBI judgment? Yes, um, the, the BPI judgment, uh, first of all, just as for a lay person, it was, it, was, it was actually an affirmation of some of the problems I was seeing in the process, even from the position of a non-legal specialist. Now, the, the situation of the, the constitution and where it comes from, again, to understand the BBI, it's almost like history repeating itself. It, and it's so important that we go back and read into history as Daisy just said. Because if we go back to like the Lancaster House talks pre-independence, it was just a recognition by the colonial government that the, the natives, if I may use that word, are getting restless and we need to sort out how to, how to, to do some transition here. So they sorted it out and the Lancaster House uh, uh, talks were actually a recipe for feudalism, if you look at it, because they picked a few individuals who are deemed either perceived or, or in reality powerful. And they came to the table with their interests, some personal, some ethnic, very, very little national. There was, they were just trying to amalgamate their individual interests into something that looked like a nation. So that passed and we created these fiefs mm -hmm. who then took power after the colonialists left. So now after the passage of time, and the, the, some, some also natural attrition, some of them have left us, other the next generation is nowhere near as strong or visionary as the, the initial one. So there's a new crisis. The natives are getting restless again and the new colonialist order is crumbling. So we need to have another, and that, mm -hmm. that's where BBI comes in. 
people are being called to the table and being told, come with your interests. What does your tribe want? What does your family want? What do you want? What do your cronies want? And everyone who supports this thing is supporting it because of something we are getting out of this, this fallacy called the national cake. I always say that they, whenever a politician says anything like a national cake, that is instantly a lie because there's no cake. We, we, are, the, we are the flour and the sugar. So we can't right. be eating ourselves. We are the ones on the table. So, so, so that's that sort of background for it. But coming down to sort of natural resources, it, it, it also drives the sort of balkanization of the country into the fact that this piece, natu natural resources starts being seen as from an extractive point of view and so and so, or this, this person or that community suddenly gets entitlement to, to extract and exploit or basically destroy mm -hmm. what, 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 uh, what might be, have been put on their plate at this table. So it's, it's very important to, to that this judgment was given because it reverses that move, that very deliberate move to place the political, economic and natural resources of our country on, on some high table where there are some high priests or fiefs who sit and the rest of us can just hope to get some crumbs off the, the plate of our respective fifth. Right, um, if I might just push back a little bit on, on, on that, uh, Mordecai. Um, the, would you characterize the 2010 constitution as a deal between politicians that then people are getting restless about? Is that what it is? Or is it the culmination of, as, as Daisy um, uh, implies, of Kenyan struggle that it, uh, the, the constitution itself encompasses what Kenyans want and it is not them who's pushing for change, it is other people. Y yes, this yes, yes. I, I, th I think, I think uh, its, its initiation came from restlessness, but it's um, the, the execution of the process Certainly, mm -hmm. certainly uh, had that aroma of a deal between between very high up political interests. Having, what having do you said mean by that, restlessness, what uh... um, the 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 restlessness that had that had come from the the, the autocratic years, the the autocratic more years, and uh, the the fact that now it seemed Kenya Kenya for Kenya government to function. There had to be this continuous violence of detaining so and so, jailing so and so, exiling so and so. This 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 doesn't this doesn't make for for any sort of stable kind of governance. It's it's a constant irritant, especially to those who want to to enjoy their power quietly. And right. <laughs> and and th th that that's what what led to the initiation of the process. But the execution certainly did did have a lot of horse trading between politicians. But having mm -hmm. said that, there were some good things that 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 came through with this, and and uh, and we certainly must cement everything about it before we can choose to change those that we may have some problem with and keep mm -hmm. those that we may have some that those that have served as well but i think to try and pass judgment on it before implementing it fully is a mistake and even if and when we need to change it the way we try to change it through this uh, strange animal called bbi is completely flawed it's it's based on it's based on cakes of which we are ingredients <laughs> right. Um, uh, Darius, let me bring you into this. What is your view about what's going on with the, uh, uh, with the judgment? First, are you happy? Were you happy with the judgment? And if you are, um, why? What, what, what was it that stood out for you? I think um, I, I really liked the judgment in and of itself because it puts a break on um, uh, sort of this uh, train by the elites to try and bring in a certain um, a certain changes to uh, the constitution as is right now, which is barely 10 years into this um, uh, document. Uh, we have implemented it quite uh, a lot, but as you know, uh, some of the leaders within the, the legal spaces, I think, uh, William Mutunga giving um, the, the former Chief Justice giving uh, his uh, speech uh, two years ago, three years ago in 2018 about just where we are in terms of the implementation and said we've done really well 
but there are still critical aspects that we need to revisit and you know sort of uh, bring them up to speed in terms of our national governance structures, in terms of our rule of law, in terms of our public participation, and all these converse, uh, conversations envisaged by the constitution. So in a sense, this um, uh, calls for referendum feel uh, in every way premature. And in a sense for the high court to sort of put this break, temporary break, if you will, um, to the whole process is pretty much welcome. Um, of course, the judgment again coming back up again, um, that is in August. But then to just take you back up a bit, Mm -hmm. My sense of uh, this moment that um, uh, the so-called two brothers um, want us to believe is a constitutional moment, it sort of has its origin um, to uh, the nullification that happened in 2017. Um, oh, right. uh, you know, with uh, Maraga and his team who basically said uh, there are certain uh, process and procedural issues here. We have to go back to the ballot. And that does a number of things. It created a certain, of course, it empowered the one faction of uh, the, the rivalry that was going on, which is um, the NASA group and the other people in the opposition. But interestingly, it created a legitimacy crisis for uh, those, the supposed winners who are you know, the, the, the president right now. And of course, some of the, the governors and, and, and the MPs but what interestingly come out of that is now when the, the, the boycott is declared by um, the NASA group, the economic boycott. Um, and that boycott, of course, one of the things is it builds up on the illegitimacy that had been brought on, uh, but one by the nullification, but also number two with the way the, was that November 26th elections was done? So in a sense, out mm -hmm. of that, March 2018, uh, we have the, uh, the handshake, and then out of that now, everything else has built upon it coming to uh, where we are. But also critically, and I think I've been on record before saying this, uh, number one, 10 years into a constitution wanting to pass such sweeping changes to a document that is barely a decade old is in every bit premature. There's nothing fundamentally flawed about how we passed it. Um, it's limitations current and possibly some discovered in the future notwithstanding. It's such a short period within which to do this. But also, often referendums are um, uh, sort of a proof of elite fragmentation, of elite dysfunction, of elite fallout. Because in most colonial states um, and in most um, uh, you know, client states and in most countries out here, uh, the, the, the rule is often by um, uh, elite consensus. You know? And of course, over the last four or five, if not six years, We've seen different kind of very fundamental elite dysfunction and elite fragmentation. So this moment feels more of you know a culmination of an elite fragmentation and their the contestation rather than really a genuine constitutional moment within the country. Yeah. Right. Um, Daisy, I think some people might argue that it is not fragmentation, but rather consensus as driving BBI. We've seen this too people that um, uh, uh, Darius referred to, the president and Raila, coming together to drive it. That doesn't look like fragmentation, does it? The question is agreement between who? Because mm -hmm. we are not saying that not everybody is disagreed with this. Um, and um, so we start with the two people who are agreed on it, uh, the president and uh, the former prime minister. So these are the two people who've agreed, but they've agreed based on a consensus that they have built among themselves, which is not necessarily for the benefit of people, the, the wider the wider citizen. It's really about power. It's a power sharing agreement, okay? And I like what uh, uh, Mordecai has said, that it, we are the ingredients. So this, so, so what they're doing is really they're bargaining because when they're bargaining with other leaders, okay? And it's also based on what that power sharing looks like, power sharing agreements. Look at all um, the people, uh, the leaders who have been brought into the BPI bandwagon. They're all coming in there with a stake, a stake mm -hmm. of what section of the people they're bringing and they're going back to the people and saying, hey guys, this is what, this is good for us because as, as these people, we will be on this table doing ABCD. But mm -hmm. these people, as us people, is them people. So it's not a consensus for the citizens. But then again, 
Let's look at these characters. These characters are second generation leaders of the independence leaders, okay? So it really goes back to the administration of our state and our resources. It really is about who gets to control the power of who does business with the country at any given time, how our resources are exploited, who gets what tenders, who gets what business. You see, we're, we're speaking at cross purposes, citizens and leaders and the current leadership. And I like what um, um, Advocate Khaminwa in his submissions at the, the Court of Appeal, he said, Kenya has been very unfortunate because we've not had good leaders as a, as a country. We've had bad leaders. Now, when you look at our leaders and when you look at what it is, they consider power. For them, power is about capturing the state and deciding who does business with the state and how our natural resources are exploited and by whom. I mean, it is, it, we, we, we find that some of the richest, the wealthiest people in this country and some even on the continent happen to be politicians. So it follows that the, the, right. their, power, their, their wealth stems from their ability to capture the state and exploit it for personal benefit. And that's really what it's about. Now, that's what we've been fighting against. That our natural resources, our nation, our state, our taxes, the, the how our country is organized should not be for the benefit of a few people. That's really what is playing out here. I mean, if we were to speak about it in crude terms and not try and couch it in a lot right. of legalese, you know, or in, in constitutional frameworks. Our constitution has, is, is the covenant between the govern, those, the sovereign people and how they want their nation to be administered. That's really what it's about. How we, we delegate that power, how we exercise that power. Mm -hmm. Now we have people who have captured power in this country, but they have not used it for the benefit of the people. And then yeah, the struggle is between us and them. Yeah, but would that, I mean, this, the sort of uh, bad leadership argument, it, it doesn't then really matter what sort of constitution, how you get it, um, uh, uh, that, that won't change whether your leaders are good or bad. You know, so my, 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 my thing is, if the problem is with how BBI is uh, was done, then would in the question be, well, we went to the people, there was a task force, we went around collecting views, we spoke to them, we combined them into a bill, and we are giving it to a referendum, people can take it, they can leave it. You know, so what specifically is then wrong with uh, uh, going that down that road? I think that first, the, the, where we began, you see, um, as, as Mutahinguni, and I'm very sorry to quote him, but I do agree with him on this point. Mm. He says one thing, he says, it doesn't go wrong, it starts wrong. So right. the BBI has started on a wrong premise, okay? The, origi the, the origins of the BBI, it has originated from a wrong place, okay? Mm -hmm. So the president himself cannot originate a constitutional amendment in the manner that they have done. So right. through a popular initiative. That is a pro problem number one, because mm -hmm. nothing stops them from being able to generate constitution proposals uh, to amend the constitution. But there are pathways that have been set for those that sit in the position of duty bearers. So you cannot decide that for this purpose, I will become a citizen, but I will use the resources available to me as a duty bearer to push my agenda as a citizen. Right. Because that pathway mm -hmm. is not available to us as citizens. The constitution right. has laid two pathways by which um, the constitution can be amended. Those two pathways are parliamentary initiative, which is reserved for duty bearers because they have instruments of power available to them to uh, uh, make law and to amend the constitution. And that is clearly spelled out. And then, there is the other pathway which is reserved for the citizen because right. we may come up uh, in a situation where the duty bearers may not necessarily be doing what we want or they would sabotage what the citizen wants. So a pathway has been created for the citizens if they are so moved to then initiate uh, amendments through popular initiative. So you cannot be dishonest and decide as a duty bearer to, right. con to convert yourself into a citizen for the purposes of 
um, overhauling the constitution. And that's what it is. You know, the, the constitution amendment bill uh, 2020 is a literal overhaul of the constitution. Our constitution has 18 chapters. Mm -hmm. The BPI is proposing to amend 14 of them. That's an overhaul. And, and I mean, like one whole chapter is, is really, you know, um, interpretation. So I, I think that we must, the process is wrong, okay? State resources have been used for what is being called a popular initiative. And of course, then there are the mm -hmm. other things about when you are bringing a proposal for amendment, can you bring so many unrelated issues? Because if you're coming sort to the of people- Sort of have it as an omnibus bill. And it is an <laughs> omnibus. And so you've got all these right. unrelated issues that uh -huh. the people need to understand what the implications are. Now, for me, I think it's important to understand the referendum route. Personally, this is how I see it. You know, we have the 10 protected clauses and those 10 protected clauses are fundamental in that it's like the foundation upon which our constitution is, is, is founded. Now, right. those are referendum issues, but they speak to issues of term limits, um, the role of parliament, devolution, it speaks to very, very key issues that once they change, you fundamentally altered our constitution, okay? Right. So one way of getting to that is you bring in other many add-ons to make people think that it's also about addressing other issues. But the real thing here is that they are seeking a referendum so that they can unshackle themselves from the limitations the straight jacket that the duty bearers have passed into by the constitution. So, right. I mean, yeah. this is my personal interpretation. Uh -huh. No, no, I, 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 I get what you're saying. And, and Mordecai, if I may just bring you in here. Um, I, th uh, I mean, all constitutions are political processes being adopted, changed. You see, they're all the product of horse trading between political forces, whether it's, you, you call them the people, you call them the politicians themselves sitting together. So in what sense is the BBI different or the BBI process different from all others? If you look at BOMAS, it could be argued that it was the same. We just had representatives, lots of whom went in with agendas that they wanted to push that were not necessarily what our people were pushing. For. Yes, I, th I think th this is a very important uh... It's, it's a very important thing to look at. One, one thing is the timing. I think, I think the, 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 the timing for a constitutional amendment or constitutional changes to, to, to coincide with a succession process or, or come, 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 come together at, at a time of change of leadership, then it's obvious. It's, it's just natural that interests in in uh, whatever new dispensation might uh, might occur will come into the discussions so it that automatically clouds whatever is being talked about it's 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 viewed through the lenses of succession and the, the immediate political future that itself is a problem and we need to we need to address that as when we want to change our constitution these are the windows within whether it's a term of a, a given parliament uh, or, or a term of a, of, a, of a president or a term of a government, we have we have to we have to see where to couch it so that it's it's uh, it's as safe as possible from those those constraints I've I've spoken about. Because right now, even at a very basic level, and and our our political leaders and legislators are some pretty sort of crass basic animals. Some of them will support this process simply because it might extend their term in parliament by even two months and they get two extra paychecks. So the, when, we are, when we are dealing with people with such really base interests, um, uh, driven by such base interests, we are, we are always in danger as, an, as a nation. Some, pe so, some, of them, some of them passed this, uh, like the county assembly passed this document without properly reading it even. Mm -hmm. Because they they just they were they just had an eye on what it implies as far as their term or the term of uh, or the political future of of the leader who would, whoever they owe allegiance to, and th these are these are non issues as far as laws are for posterity, and we are, we are we are sinking into this ditch of passing laws for expediency. What would they consider to be, or what would make 
uh, proposed um, uh, 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 amendment legitimate that it is not just is not something that politicians are playing around is it the fact that they do that box ticking exercise or is there something more fundamental to it i think definitely there's something more fundamental than um uh, basically uh, a, a bunch of uh, political operatives sitting around and deciding uh, maybe we need to change the constitution and that's why it's on safeguards ensure that they uh, even if they wake up tomorrow these safeguards will have them go through a certain process but um there is no uh, sort of time limit through which uh, you're able to say um, you know we'll have to change it every three years we'll have to change it every five years we'll have to change it every 15 years but then within the window that it takes to be able to you know basically fully put uh, you know implement the, the status that you've been given in a particular constitutional document and being cognizant of the constraints that you know, or the limits that the current document uh, gives to, you know, the respective offices, the public itself, um, the citizens, and being able to say that within this process, we've been able to implement certain uh, statutes um, uh, that of course are still within the constitution, whether it's within the penal codes, whether it's still within political processes. Then at the tail end of that, you can say, we have been able to implement um, all other facets um, of, public uh, basically life to be able to augment the constitution, but also to try and get around some of its limits. When you come to that very end, then we can begin to say, we have exhausted all other avenues within the constitution and which within other um, uh, statutes, uh, whether it's local, international, the political processes, and we've come to the end and beyond here, the limits of the current constitutional documents were under that we will have to consider. Uh, so amendment of the constitution should be basically a, a last resort. It, it is, it's the last resort in this journey where you've implemented the document itself, you've implemented every other statutes and facets of public life that allows you to have a healthy functional society to the point where you're saying now, this is where we can push, uh, you know, uh, to implement a healthy society within the limits that this document and this uh, basically living constitution gives us. Then we can begin to have that conversation. Yeah. Right. Um, Daisy, if I, if I, if I may ask, um, just a follow up to what Darius has said. Um, uh, I mean, you've been in the whole push for reform for a long time. Um, uh, remember, uh, after. Um, uh, Kibachi was elected um, in 2002, um, Mishuki came and told us that reform was about getting rid of Moi. And now that Moi has gone, we, don't, we no longer need reform. And this seems to me to be very similar to what is happening now, because they are trying to put us back to what we had in 2010, uh, when most people are saying this Musumkate thing doesn't work for us. Now it seems to me that all right, Kibaki has gone and stuff. So now perhaps Musumkate can work. How is it that we can make sure reform is actually something that reflects what people want rather than what politicians want? You know, uh, it really boils down to the kind of leadership that you have, because you see the leaders are the ones that will push the agenda for, well, the policies and the legislation necessary for the reform. The statements of um, Mishuki are very unfortunate at that time. Uh, go back to what uh, Mordecai spoke of when he talked about leaders who are led by their base interests, okay? And essentially what um, uh, Mishuki was saying at that time is, they needed Moi out, but what did they want Moi out for? See, they, it was because they wanted power. So now that they had power and they believed that them, they knew how to administer power. And power for what? Is it for the people? So we go well, back. Well, this the is people the same are telling Moi to go home and have his goats and then see how a country can be run. You know, yes, but, but you see. The very same things he was doing. Exactly. But you see, for, for them, they were saying, okay, he's. For, his, for them, his mismanagement, he was mismanaging them and excluding them, okay? Right. They were excluded from mm. the, whether it was administration or maladministration of the state, that's a, diff a different thing altogether. Mm. However, what the bombers did is now what Darius is talking about, bringing the people together because um, you, 
if you want to change the constitution, having done all you can indeed to implement it and there are certain limitations, you call what we what the president was saying was a national conversation, bringing people to a national conversation. Remember, the Bombers was a constituent assembly. It was a national right. conversation. Mm -hmm. There was representation from across the country and Kenyans were speaking. They had their representatives. Many of the delegates who were there had been sent there from the districts, right? And mm -hmm. they were discussing, they were bringing their district issues. So that's the kind of thing that you would want to see when talking about a major overhaul. What we have right now with the BBI, mm -hmm. Patrick Gathara, and all persons, uh, you know, tuned into this broadcast mm -hmm. is a coup against the constitution and the people of Kenya. And let me say this, you know, when we look at what is happening in the region, East Africa has been very unfortunate in, um, in the African continent in terms of leaders who amend their constitution. They have used different routes. You know, before in Africa, you came with bullets and guns and you know you overthrew the government there were mm -hmm. you know internal riots and you know people by the force of arms took over government that has really been discouraged globally the au discourages those kind of takeovers so now we have seen a different kind of takeover which is smooth operation by leaders whereby they amend the constitution subvert the will of the people and succeed themselves it has mm -hmm. happened in Uganda. It has happened in Rwanda. We saw uh, in Burundi, uh, the late Nkrumziza did it and the devastating effects. And I believe that is what um, Kenya is up to. Because you see, it is also important for us to listen to the political chatter because we cannot speak about these things in isolation because they're not happening in isolation. They're happening right. in a political theater. And when you listen to the chatter, and the, the, the calls that are coming out of the, in this chapter, their voices like Atwoli's, which started crying out from 2018, that our president is too young to retire. No, now, is too young. <laughs> yes, that he's too young to retire. Right. And you know, then they are, they are now they have tried to say uh, uh, because of COVID, uh, we can amend the, the we can extend the life of the presidency and the term of the term of parliament because we right. can't go for elections. We look at how the media, unfortunately, seems to have been co-opted into this narrative when the African court made a ruling that based on certain parameters and governed by internal laws and constitutions in countries, right. then you can consider, consider um, postponing elections for um, because of COVID. And our newspapers uh, came blasting us with that the court has given the green light to postpone <laughs> elections. Now, right. all of now, so so so, all this is happening within the context of an imminent um, transition in leadership mm -hmm. because the current holder of the presidency is not eligible for another term. Okay. Mm -hmm must leave office so mm -hmm. it is not in it's not a coincidence that we have these calls for too young to retire that's postponed for it so that's really what is happening so bpi is in essence a constitutional coup against the people of kenya where by law or is somebody calls it lawfare now it's not guerrilla warfare it is lawfare by law the president is seeking to extend his term in mm -hmm. office and subvert the will of the people, which by the way, we know is not the two term limit didn't come with the constitution 2010. It's a 1991 requirement. Remember right. the repeal of mm -hmm. section 2A, the term limits we identified overstay of power as one of the, one of the reasons why the country is not stable. So, mm -hmm. so for me, I think we must call it what it is. And so the BBI ruling has essentially affirmed those principles and has put a, a temporary stop right. and I hope oh. also a stop, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, a court of appeal will also affirm that, but has put right. a stop to the unfolding coup. Right, but I think, um, and, and Monica, you can uh, uh, perhaps respond to this. Um, the, 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 if, if you look at bombers, um, uh, which uh, Daisy has spoken about, 
um, it was at the end point of a process. People had been pushing for a constitution for changes um, uh, from the late 80s, you know, through the 90s when we had uh, almost daily mandamano, you know, uh, and stuff to change things, you know. Um, and I'm wondering whether the, the, the problem we have with BBI is simply that it seems to be driven all from the top and there is no engagement um, uh, uh, at the bottom in terms of involving people like civil media and stuff like that. Um, is that the real sort of crux of it, that it is simply politicians trying to cut a deal amongst themselves without it being an impetus, as it's reflecting a push from below? Yes, I think that's a very crucial point. And, um at the expense of, of, of sounding like a lot of the meaningless chatter we hear today about this bottom up and top down things. The, the BBI, the BBI is driven by cutting deals at the top and the people at the bottom support it because their tribal fee for political fee is perceived as getting something and they hope to get some crumbs from, from, what, from what this guy is getting. And the, the basic flaw in that is the fallacy that people at the top can somehow have enough such that they're so full that they're probably vomiting enough for the people at the bottom to get something to eat. And this doesn't happen, not in Kenya, not anywhere else in the world. The people at the top do not get enough. By definition, there, there is no... By, by principle, they're not able to get enough. And that's why they're not able to, to countenance life outside political office or after political office. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is the problem that whatever goes to, whatever is supposed, either goes to the bottom in reality or in perception, has to go through someone at the top. So there's no reform in dairy sector so that the, the dairy farmer in uh, Nyeri will go and get whatever is due to him from the local dairy industry. The reform is, so, this and that is given to, this much resources is given to the guy who, who leads the Nyeri people, and hopefully he'll have enough so that he'll talk to the people and they tell him we want a dairy plant and he'll take some of this huge largesse that he's been given access to and use it to make a dairy plant. So they, they are looking for crumbs from him. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's the fundamental flaw. None of the proposed changes or, or benefits are systemic. They are through individuals and, and uh, individuals, some, some by lineage, some by political parties and, and some by, by wealth as well. None of them by sort of any logical, um, logical procedure of, of choice. Right, um, Darius, the, the, I think, one of the things I've noticed is um, there's been sort of a, a huge shift where we have ended up with the idea that all change is to be done from within. So before we used to push it, we had strong civil society that was pushing for change outside. Since 2003, we've seen churchmen all wanting to be MPs. We've seen journalists wanting to be MP. We've seen um, civil society activists trying to be MPs, you know, and sort of pushing the idea that actually it's only in parliament that um, these sorts of changes that we want are effected. Would this be part of the reason why then we end up with this kind of top-down approach to making changes so that we have kind of overstaffed, if you will, the political system with uh, quote unquote our best and brightest um, uh, and rather than it being something that is reflective or it's growing from under, it is being, it is now them who are then imposing back on society the sorts of changes that they think um, uh, are required. I think there are a number of um, ideas that drove uh, that kind of over concentration towards uh, politics. I think in 2003, we sort of slackened, you know, and understandably so, we were voted the most optimistic people, nation state in the world then for a brief moment. 
we thought, okay, this whole uh, Moy and the 90s and the 80s and all the ghosts all the way back to the 60s or 1890 or 1920, whichever how far back we can go, we sort of exercised, uh, you know, uh, those uh, skeletons. So we said, okay, now it's, you know, as, as uh, 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 John's uh, famous book, you know, I mean, it was a time to eat. And while that statement has certain undertones to eat, it yeah. also cut across very many facets of society. It was our time to eat for very many different <laughs> people within very many different spaces. It was a prosperous <laughs> moment. So we sort of slackened our levers in terms of the safeguards that we had. And of course, you look at it two years later, we already very crudely reminded that, you know, we can't take our hand <laughs> off our accountability uh, measures. By two or five, we are doing the chungwa and, the, you know, that conversation comes in, you realize, uh oh. Maybe it was a bit too soon, you know. And so, in I mean, interestingly, that is one of it. The second one, of course, it's how technology just revolutionized across sectors, across professions, across industries. So a lot of how we done things um, in the 90s, uh, in the 2000s, suddenly, and a lot of it is Kibaki and where the former president and what he did in terms of uh, subsidizing the ICT space. And we have this explosion. So, the public sphere also shifted in a way. And so I guess a lot of people who were fighting here went in, into you know, the, the political space. Those who were not even there figured, you know, there's many other things we can do out here. So it, it fundamentally altered, those two things fundamentally altered um, the public space. But then also when you come to 2010, there's a new constitution, we increase the number of slots you know, available with the devolution and these new structures that we had in. So there was also more spaces for people to go into and to try and uh, sort of uh, bring change uh, to the country. So I think within those three dimensions, we, we had already created a space where a lot of people figured they could go into politics. But of course, that being a very general sort of a broad um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, look at it, uh, broken down by, uh, let's say, um, uh, different uh, spaces that people found themselves in. Of course, you had Code, you had uh, Jubilee, we had NAC. Along the way, all these, of course, we had the Grand National Unity, which had its own a lot of uh, challenges that were thrown at it. We had the Nusumkate. So all along, we've had moments that have opened up new spaces in terms of state agencies, in terms of committees, in terms of um, opportunity, basically almost as some sort of a political entrepreneurship that sort of Look, so many people who are in you know various disparate industries, professions, spaces, you know, fighting for our democracy, feeling okay, we did our job, or at least we got it done well enough. Let's go to parliament and maybe try do it from there. You know, right? Probably it hasn't worked out really. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, clearly it hasn't. Um, yeah. I just remind uh, the people who are listening, uh, our audience, that uh, you can put in your questions. Um, either on the Q and A uh, a function or the chat function at the bottom of your screens, we'll be taking those as we go. And in fact, um, I can just start off with one that is kind of linked to what um, Darius was saying um, uh, from Abdurrahman Mohammed, um, uh, and he basically says that the High Court ruling has reaffirmed the integrity of civil society and saved our country uh, from sharing into uncharted waters, but. He asked now the crucial questions. How can we have full confidence that the petitioners themselves um, would eventually betray the people and do a kibuda kibwana? Um, I think Daisy is referring to the fact that um, if you look at Kenya's history, the reformers, every time we put them into power, have become the new oppressors. You know, um, do you think that the judgment does reaffirm? Um, uh, civil society um, uh, does provide space for civil society to kind of emerge from the slumber I think they have been in for a while. Um, uh, and do you think we can trust them now to kind of push um, agenda for societal and social reform? First of all, Hadara, to be fair to civil society, I actually don't think that civil society have been in slumber. Civil society are suffering the same fate that is now being visited upon the judiciary, where you have a government that is so openly hostile uh, to you and fights you at every turn, runs smear campaigns and creates perceptions um, around 
around you. You remember the evil society narrative that was started as part of the campaigns, the 2013 campaigns for the presidency when the, uh, the, the now president and deputy president at that time as candidates were uh, facing um, the ICC, uh, the ICC charges. So I think um, we need to be fair to the civil society and not repeat the mantra that has been used negatively against civil society by a political class that is determined to shut down voices of accountability. In fact, if uh, nothing uh, else- David, if, if I may interrupt. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, couldn't it be argued that civil society has always been under the cosh? I mean, uh, under Moi, civil society was really sort of stepped on. They used to be beaten up in the streets. They used to be exiled. In fact, it was far worse than we see now, but they were still able to bring out their voice and to push an agenda for change. So is it the case that even with the easier circumstances now, I mean, why is it that we're not seeing them as active as they used to be? So I think that uh, we need to look at context. In the context of Moi, remember that Moi was a singular enemy at that time, not just for civil society, but for very many even political actors. And so there was a consolidation of effort. It wasn't civil society working alone, it was civil society, politicians, working with the churches, you know, and all that. Then we had the, the Kibaki presidency. And the Kibaki presidency was very friendly, very accommodating of civil society, and many civil society actors, because of the role that they played in the pre-Kibaki years and the fight for the removal of uh, you know, the Tanu uh, regime and the fight for a different kind of political order, quite a few of them were absorbed into um, the, the government and uh, legislature, civil service, you know, quite a few of them went in. So there was also a transition in civil society. And of course, the working relationship between civil society and the Kibaki government was a good working relationship. His government was not a hostile, it wasn't hostile to civil society. And I suppose at that point, you know, there was already established, I mean, you've got 10 years of a good working relationship. And then suddenly here you are faced now with a government that is openly hostile and openly beating down on you after you've already done away with it. But you're also split. Because remember that some of our, our colleagues are in, on the other side now, and some of them are part of the people that are fighting against. We have people who are in civil society who have now turned into people you cannot even recognize. You know, <laughs> they are the people, they are the people that were being fought. You know, it's a sort of like the transformation of Museveni from being a guerrilla, uh, you know, uh, fighter to, uh, you know, the, the, right. the deliverer of his people and now the oppressor of his people. So, I mean, some people have really come full circle. So I, I think that we've, we've got to understand it within that context. However, let us also look at the role that civil society has played. Remember, courts do not move themselves. Courts mm -hmm. are moved. And many of the judgments that we've had that have pushed back against the excesses of this government, against the excesses that we have seen duty bearers trying to exert you know, on the people and, you know, sort of like circumvent the constitution has been brought by civil society. Some right. many, many of the landmark rulings, including our case for the dissolution of parliament, mm -hmm. that is civil society work. Um, and right. so I think that civil society has been active, but we must look at the context because we must not see our activism and our work only through the prism of running battles with the state, right, right. you know? Uh, because every 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 fight is a different fight. We've got different battles. We've got the, the overall war, but mm -hmm. the, the battles are different. So we're fighting different battles. So civil society is absolutely not in slumber, not mm -hmm. at all. They have been organizing. And in fact, if nothing else for me, the BBI for me is also a sign of success or even the, sorry, the judgment of the BBI is one of the successes of the civil society. And of course, right. uh, the, the thing, the stick with which uh, uh, they will be beaten by, because they are being told, uh, you know, the president says that it's against the will of the people. But what is the will of the people? The will of the people is manifested in the constitution. So civil society has, has played its role. The thing that we really do need to, to get us, um, and that is 
citizen activism. We, aside from just civil society, we also need citizens to be active, to demand accountability from leaders. That's the mm -hmm. only way that you're gonna stop people, uh, so-called you know, clean people getting into government or positions of authority and then morphing into um, oppressors. We know of the phrase that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Right. When there are no checks and balances, people tend to, can fly off the rails, you know? And the natural order of things is chaotic, you know? It takes effort to, to have order. It takes, you have to be deliberate to maintain order. And one of the things that I have found, and this is, um, this is something that I think as citizens, we need to be more cautious about, is that we vent a lot on social media. Um, we, we, make, um, we make light of a lot of very serious things that are happening in our country, make light of uh, corruption and theft of public funds and all that. Maybe it's a coping mechanism, but we need to become more active. And for me, I see that happening gradually because with the advent of devolution and public participation, we're seeing citizens actually becoming active. There is an awareness about their power. We saw even in 2017, how many uh, leaders were actually removed from office, entire counties, you know, the leadership was overhauled because the leadership is closer to the people. The people see the, the, the development or the maladministration, whichever it is that you're delivering to them. And people are beginning to come out of that, uh, the place where leaders are the ones who say how it goes. So we need to build on that. And that is the work that civil society has been doing, raising awareness and building capacity of citizens at the grassroots level to actively engage duty bearers and to demand accountability. The minute we get that done, and for me, that's why I see these people are insisting upon BBI, that they do not like the demands of accountability, that they feel like, who are you? And that's the place where a lot of the leadership comes from, including the president. Who is civil society? You are not elected. Who is the citizen? You're not elected. To that's ask the same question of, of who is Wanjiko? You know, uh, exactly. Uh, what does uh, Wanjiko uh, know? But right. Wanjiko must continue to assert herself. And let right. me tell you, we just have to keep at it. Right, um, and, and th this brings me to uh, Michael Ojuang's question, um, uh, because he asks about um, the accounting for the funds that were spent um, uh, on MCAs, uh, on MCAs. Um, uh, uh, for the car grant that were given so they could pass the, the BBI bill. Um, and, and I'm wondering, Mordecai, what would um, uh, active citizenry in this case look like, you know, um, if we were to just uh, step away from simply the, the uh, uh, people talking on social media, you see, are there other ways of engagement that are effective that can then be, we, where when it comes to things like the changes we want in society, we are able to push for them and not wait for quote unquote leaders to come and articulate them for us? Um, yeah, first of all, on the, on the question of that funding spent, um, to my ad admittedly layperson uh, legal knowledge, if anyone was to accept that the president, the, to accept the premise that the president was, is a private citizen, then certainly he and all the other public servants involved in this thing should pay back all that money that was spent on the process. Because then, the, in that case, we were spending state money on what was uh, private citizens' uh, business. But looking at um, sort of an active citizenry, first of all, so social media, first of all, is very important, particularly okay, in the field that I come from. Um, a lot of my ideas, and I think conservation is very similar to many other fields in Kenya in this way, it's inherently dishonest, it follows the money, and everyone's got a price. That's how conservation functions. So mm -hmm. people are terrified to point out even the smallest policy problems or practice problems. So the social media space has been very important, certainly for me to get these ideas out and, they, and many of them have gotten traction. But it's important that we start asking questions, whether it's about what, what you're being told to bring your kid to school with, 
whether it's mm-hmm. what you are being told about the price of producer price of milk, about regulation of uh, waru production, regulation of of beekeeping and this kind of thing, we must ask those hard questions and ask them relentlessly. Because if you look at the way the government has backtracked on certain things, we cannot deny that that um, active citizenry in, in, in actual life or in social media has played a role. Because certain, certainly our legislature has been absolutely useless. So it's not them who has pushed back, it's the mm-hmm. citizenry. So people must realize the power they have. We as the citizens can point out that something stinks, something smells bad, and we can make it we can make it unattractive to these these crass politicians who always want to look good. Right. That's, yeah, that's their best weakness. So I think we must ask questions wherever we are, whether we are in the marketplace, whether in the churches, whether in schools, etc. We must question these things because there's so many so many things that are going wrong and flying simply because no one asked, they were waiting for someone else to ask. Okay, I'm I'm seeing a few hands have been put up here by people. I'm not sure whether uh, it's possible for them to to speak, Um, but if you can't, um, uh, Zahid, maybe you can unmute and see whether you can ask your question. We must realize that the constitution came from the post-election violence, um, you know, and the setting up of uh, agenda four and the very vital role that civil society played in sort of working with the uh, African Union um, and with Kofi Annan and, and others. And I think that formed a very, very strong base uh, to, to, to have a voice in Kenya uh, that was uh, progressive. We managed to get in a constitution as a result of that. And you must remember that uh, the, the ruling class was extremely perturbed that uh, 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 that they would lose all political legitimacy. And I think that the, the, the general cry for a new constitution, whatever that meant for the Kenyan people, uh, became priority not only for uh, for the people of Kenya. Uh, Zahid, do you have a question? Uh, yeah. Yes, I mean, uh, I, I just want to put a context to where this thing came from. And I also just like to say that really, um, I, I think, you know, looking at that the, what is happening to the constitution and the bringing of BBI is really, uh, it is a move towards, it, it is a right-wing move throughout the world to destroy civil liberties and to destroy uh, any form of democracy. So what, uh, so what uh, and the only reason Kibaki didn't do anything because he really wasn't in power and there were other people ruling it. But when, when the two took over, there was no doubt that they were moving right that they had all kinds of things of playing the international funders, one against the other, China against the IMF and the World Bank and the West. Now, of course, you know we know what's going on with the US. So it's just that the context of what's happening to us now is not related just to civil society uh, you know, coming under attack, but really it is, it is the destruction of any progressive voice that, mm-hmm. you know, that, that whether, whether Ruto comes in or whoever comes in. Um, I think and also... Uh, Raila quickly realized that being on the progressive side. Was- okay, Zahid, Zahid, I think we've uh, uh, we've had your concern. Um, uh, yeah. I'll let the panel respond to that. Um, uh, maybe before that, just uh, I'll, I'll allow um, Abdurrahman. Um, uh, you can uh, you should be able to to, to speak now. Yes, Abdurrahman, Muhammad, and keep it brief. I come from from Garissa. Uh, people, uh, you know, there's a mass lack of civic, civic education. People actually don't understand the roles of these leaders, the roles of these, you know, politi- political offices. They don't even understand the roles of, of, of you know, the governors and the MPs. And all. So how can such people hold the leaders accountable if they don't understand their roles? So have the civil society done enough in that? Another question, if you can pro- perhaps allow me, uh, hey, is briefly. that uh, the problem, uh, very briefly, uh, before even we talk about the, the constitution, all this, is that uh, we know that the, the constitution, the 2020 constitution, as much as it's very progressive, the problem is has been the constitutionalism, the implementation of the constitution. Have the civil society done enough in trying to push the government to implement the constitution? We have seen that the issue of the two-third gender rule, uh, you know, being brought to you know to several petitions. But have they done enough in trying to push the government to implement to fully implement the constitution? Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Daisy, do you want to respond uh, first to um, uh, Zahid's 
concern about sort of the global moment um, of all of this where we've seen across the world the kind of move towards the right wing uh, thing, the diminution even in places like the US that were supposed to be like bastions of democracy, where you've had diminution of uh, people's rights and stuff. And also um, to Abdul Rahman's point about the move from civil society to civic society. Okay, let me start with Abdul Rahman and say that um, when we talk about civil society doing enough, uh, first of all, I think that civil society has done the best it can with what they have available. The biggest challenge uh, that uh, civil society has is uh, uh, resources, donor dependence. But one of the things that civil society has been trying to push is for civic education and civic awareness to become part of the curriculum or um, uh, part of the curriculum for um, all Kenyans, you know, from school, you know, the way we used to do civics and, uh, uh, and onward. But our government seems to be very reluctant to make available um, civic education and civic awareness. Remember even President Pinata in 2016, in the run up to the 2017 essentially said, Kenyans don't need civic education. So right. there's been uh, there's there's actually been a resistance towards civic education and attacks on civil society for providing that civic education, which also goes back to a leadership that doesn't want an aware uh, a citizen that is aware because it's not just about pushing for your rights; it's also knowing your responsibilities as a citizen. So it's like self sabotage. So why do we keep the people ignorant? We keep them ignorant of their rights, but we also keep them ignorant of their responsibility. And so it becomes a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. So I think that we do the best we can as civil society in terms of providing civic awareness and civic education, in terms of uh, going to court and uh, you know moving the courts to affirm, reaffirm certain uh, rights and, uh, and, and, and entitlements to citizens while also pushing back against certain illegal maneuvers by beauty bearers. And I think civil society have played that role and continue to play that role. I do want to agree with um, Zahid that we are seeing a very worrying trend and it is global and it has mm -hmm. been ushered in, uh, you know, particularly during the season of uh, COVID pandemic, where we are seeing more auto autocratic uh, autocracy uh, emerging, d dictatorships, where people are being forced uh, by their governments and by the states, or we're using very heavy hand uh, to roll back on many democratic, democratic uh, values and inherent principles. Now that is very worrisome. So that I think that as um, as the the within our Kenyan context. We need to start looking at how do we defend our nascent democracy? How do we begin to uh, push back against already what we're seeing as a dictatorship, a budding dictatorship, but mm -hmm. also using other means? Because the dictatorship uh, we are seeing emerging did not just start with COVID. It has been uh, rearing its head every so often, but it's now using COVID as a right. means to assert itself. So I think that's a that's that's a huge topic and, and it's something that we need to discuss collectively because what it also means is that we may also have lost some of our allies because if it is a global phenomenon um, and governments have essentially agreed that they're going to use a heavy hand uh, in driving certain interests and certain uh, uh, agenda, um, then we cannot rely on external partners. or We may not be able to rely on external partners to be able to put our governments in check. So what does that mean? So I think that is a conversation maybe you could curate, curate a GIF, right. because I think it is something that people really need <laughs> right. to- It's actually to, a good point. Um, the, and, and I wanted to follow about, it up yeah. uh, uh, with Darius for a bit, because um, the, the, I mean, the, the question of, how we finance both uh, civil society is, is a big one. Um, uh, uh, and, 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 and as Daisy knows much more than I do, one of the cautious that is used to beat up uh, uh, civil society activists is that their mouthpieces, they're described 
as mouthpieces of the West because of the funding that uh, is perceived to come from, uh, uh, from the West to them. Um, we've seen, especially since um, uh, uh, Uhuru came in, this sort of idea of a shift to the East, more um, uh, engagement with the Chinese. And there is also a question of uh, whether that is a model that our rulers are looking at as one that they should adopt that is more top down, um, more oppressive, you know, less tolerant of civil liberties. What do you think um, uh, should be the role of people within this context in terms of pushing for the changes that they want? What are the opportunities that they have? And do you think the BBI judgment actually affirms this, makes this more possible? Or, or I mean, what, what's your view on that? I think um, the question that has, um, I think there was a head who brought up uh, basically, or oh, should, should I mean Abdul Rahman, and where he's basically asking the question of how the civil society done enough in terms of uh, public participation and civic education for you know the citizens. And I think, well, partly this is a role of uh, the civil society, the, the, the process of coming up with um, active citizens goes beyond uh, the mandate or the scope of what the civil society um, you know, can play. Of course, them being one of the vibrant and key actors in terms of uh, whether it's voter sensitization or just generally uh, you know, civic participation and civic education. But much more importantly, it's actually an educational problem. And I think it's been tackled by uh, different other respective leaders um, one day are talking about the flower within our education philosophy, which in a sense uh, has uh, places a huge emphasis on the classroom and its dialectics while you know, leaving out the many other facets of everyday knowledge centers within society, such that the citizen is not prepared to be able to actively understand and engage the different levers and structures in society. So it's, there's a challenge within which it's also partly uh, uh, partly uh, an educational problem, such that if the civil society are playing their role, but also educational philosophy inculcates, you know, libraries, uh, museums, uh, you know, the different respective archives in the society, an active mm -hmm. engagement with the knowledge uh, systems that we have in the country, such that the end product of this is a citizen who understands within you know, their the, the roles and rights and responsibilities in society in a much more broader way than just thinking, as you had mentioned earlier, either run into politics because you have the money to buy or decide you know, that this is the job of the civil society as mm -hmm. just one segment and yet required to handle. Yeah, but is, is, it, yeah. Um, yeah, is it like a chicken and egg sort of thing? Because we talk of generating this um, act uh, active society as if there's something that's got to be done for them to be there, but still at the same stage, we are saying that, well, actually active citizens should be active, should be doing stuff, you know? So are we caught in a bind between not identifying who is to enable them to do this? Because it obviously wouldn't be the politicians that don't have any interest in that, you know? Um, uh, and sort of the expectations that somehow out of their own uh, impetus that citizens should be going out there and holding people to account. You know, How do they actually do this? I think it's a spectrum. We, we, we are not on the extreme ends of either. I think the, the different um, respective segments of society, um, whether it's within professional spaces or everyday um, lifestyle, um, people with the different educational uh, and, and exposure are within society, able to understand some things better than others, able to fight for certain issues and rights better than others. So I think it is a spectrum. And I don't, I don't think we are doing too badly off. Um, Daisy has mentioned a number of um, challenges that have been and petitions that have been brought up against the state where on matters and issues that you know, certain agencies within the state are trying to impose on people, latest of course being the BBI, but also the livestock bills, uh, the, the livestock bill among farmers, and the many other examples around that. So I think 
there's a space for consolidating what we are already doing in terms of uh, the activeness of the you know the citizens out there but there's also a space for trying to again understand where is the public right now and especially the voting public one of the crucial things being now within the context of this conversation is the fact that we have about 6 million new voters coming in you know right um born 2004 surviving and Basically, uh, you know, uh, they, they're allowed to buy people born 2004, which is way into the, the, the process of creating this new constitution. What has been their generational formation? How do they understand their space within uh, this uh, new public? Do they, what is the, do they feel is their stake in terms of us going into the next year's election, us going into a possible referendum? How do they understand that? Where are they? And then how do we walk that journey with them? So it's different spaces, different generations, different industries, different professions, different sectors being somewhere along that spectrum. And there's a space for just taking stock and saying, where is your, you know, would say typical active citizen? And how do we begin to consolidate all these public spiritedness of what we'd call the voting public? Yeah. OK. Um if, uh, Mordecai is still there? Um, the role of civil society, it's also very important that we, the citizenry, become responsible because civil, the other threat that civil society faces, and I sympathize with, with Daisy and others in that arena, is that Kenyan, Kenyan public is very selective. We are very happy. We ask, what is civil society doing when they're protecting our rights? But when they protect the rights of maybe minority groups like on issues like sexual orientation issues like freedom of speech with music which we may not like mm -hmm. on the issue of rights of atheists and such things then we are suddenly whipping up mobs against civil society then when the government oppresses us we ask you where is civil society oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah so we we also we we have to we have to ad, we have to admit to ourselves that we have a responsibility to learn what civil society is there for. It's there to work for the good of everybody, not just the good of this party, this religion, this ethnic group, etc. And I think civil society in the work they do, they should not just include education about our rights and voting, they should include education about civil society. Teach us about yourselves. <laughs> well, I think, well, I mean, one of the things that it seems to me from this conversation that is required is also just how should people then respond once we we know that there are problems that you see? How do they actually then engage with this system? One of the things, um, Mordecai, there's, there's a question here that I thought um, uh, it kind of links with what you've just said. Um, uh, Wanuma Oweru um, basically asks um, how we can get Kenyans to vote uh, more intelligently you know, uh, to make, as in his words, to make sensible voting decisions. Do you think that is the problem? The, I mean, Daisy keeps talking about uh, our bad leaders and you, you've you also mentioned how they're, they're selfish. Is a problem that it is the Kenyans who are putting them in so that we are actually the architects of our own fate? Y yes, yes, to some extent that is true. And I, I think, I think um, we need to look at we need to look at long long term interests as as in and long term interests at a basic level if it pick your i mean you can pick whatever all from all the struggles that we kenyans have if you are a farmer and you're struggling with issues of cost of farm inputs and all that we must we must sort of become selfish sort of and start looking at what what does candidate x or which candidate does anything for farmers and from very basic level at uh, M M MCA govern county government type devolved unit level look at the immediacy of our problems and what these people do for us because we i think we get caught up in in party in party politics and our parties have gotten very good at very good at um whipping up support for party despite anything else it's 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 like the way bbi was because everyone those who support it, support it because so-and-so is getting this and that. People are not even mm -hmm. sure what it entails. So I think, yes, we have to step back and look at our children. Do our children have good schools? Then ask, look at what people are talking about uh, about schools. And if they're not saying anything, 
be willing to reject someone on what he's not saying because we, we tend to vote based on what they are saying. Right. Um, just uh, to push back a bit on that, I mean, uh, if you look at how Kenyans have been voting in the last five since the, 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 the 60s, um, pretty much half of MPs keep getting thrown out. You know, so we there there seems to be that people are trying to change those who represent them. But even when we vote in good people, they always turn out to be bad. So if you are saying we should vote more intelligently, how can we ensure that once people are in, they won't just turn around and become now the bad people? I, I, I agree with you in that, okay, what, one thing that is that is very key, although this is probably not at the, the level, most, someone who's better at governance can point out where this is, it's because they, I don't think it's at the level of the, of the voter. Parli powers of parliament have to be significantly reduced in terms of their authority over their own terms. Mm -hmm. Because the authority over their own terms is what makes parliament and our legislature so extremely lucrative that I think it was days you mentioned earlier on that people who get into the system, it's our like our system, our system exists to serve itself. That people right. who get into the system lose their way completely, and it's simply because of, it's simply because of these terms that they have the power to determine their own terms. That's something that mm -hmm. needs to be seriously addressed, in order to make people even keep promises that they do make. Because I also know some people who have been so good who have known personally, and once they get into the legislature, it's, <laughs> it's, it all becomes yeah, like it's, it's night and right. day. Right. Um, uh, just a reminder to the people who are listening, uh, to our audience, um, if you want to ask a question, you can put it on the chat function uh, or the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, or you can put up your hand. Um, uh, and, and then if, if you want to actually speak, then I can call upon you to ask a question. I'm saying, Abdurrahman, um, uh, your hand is still up. Um, I'm assuming you have a question to ask. I'm just asking that. Uh... I think uh, because I come from uh, Garissa, I'm based in Garissa, and the issue of uh, basically uh, doing civic education and all that is very necessary because uh, people don't actually understand the roles of these offices. Like, if there's no no way you can hold your MP, your MCA, your governor accountable if you don't understand the functions. People don't, they don't even understand the devolved functions that come under the county. So I was actually wanted to ask: is that uh, we know that this. Uh, constitutional reforms now are driven by, uh, you know, political big, big wigs. Uh, how can we ensure, as a, a civil society, play a role that this turns to a wave of change, which was similar to the other quest, uh, you know, that during, which, which was to do away with the 1969 constitution? Uh, can we, can the civil society uh, provide like an alternative and uh, leadership? That is, that is the question I was asking, because we have seen so many people who are, you know, the faces of the civil society right now, but behind the scenes, there are actually strategists uh, for some of these, you know, politicians and uh, political movements. Sorry to say that, but I think it's a fact. Okay. Um. Uh, thanks for that, Raman. Um. I think uh, Daisy. I mean, we we saw there was a point. I think when we'd seen even civil society guys almost forming a political party, you know, uh, uh, to run. Um. I don't know where that where we are with that. But the question I think stands: Is it actually their role and do they risk being tarred with the same brush as politicians if they go to become sort of active in the um, uh, in elective politics? Okay, um, before I answer that, um, let me also just say, uh, Mordecai talked about uh, restraining uh, the legislature and the politicians from being able to determine their terms. That's one of the things that the Constitution 2010 has sought to do. And, and I think that we need to value one uh, uh, a key component of the Constitution 2010, which is the independent commissions. And mm -hmm. um, we have seen how those independent commissions have really been attacked so that they're not able to perform their roles. We have the Salaries and Remuneration Commission, which is uh, tasked with the responsibility of determining the, the, the terms and conditions of employment for all state officers of whom politicians are. But they have really you know, given pushback against it. 
we have seen them determining their own terms. So it's really about how do we ensure that those independent institutions remain independent and as, citizen, as citizens defend that independence. Because for as long as they weaken the institutions of governance, the independent institutions that are supposed to offer checks and balances against the excesses of power, particularly by the legislator and the executive, then we are going to be, uh, we will continue in this lamentation. The idea behind the independent commissions is so that they, we can check the excesses of power. Mm -hmm. Now, um, your the the question now about civil society and people and and you know coming into public office. I do believe that the idea is there. I know people are working uh, around it about around the issue of alternative leadership, bringing alternative leadership. The question is, is there goodwill from the people? How do we uh, how do we bring the people to the point that they are willing to accept different leaders? Because one of the things that has really destroyed our politics is the monetization of politics in Kenya. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, the Campaign Financing Act, <laughs> which was uh, uh, promulgated, I mean, that act came into, uh, well, it was, it was passed in 2012. It's never been operationalized because our politicians just don't want campaign financing to be regulated. That is very problematic. Citizens, because many people have been rendered poor and needy, uh, uh, campaigns are open season. So are people willing really to listen to alternative views and take a chance with people who don't have money? If Darius uh, presents himself to the citizens for election, will they listen to him and his ideas and give him a chance? That's the conversation that we need to have with people because what uh, the, the, the corruption that we see that it's it's i mean it's massive corruption in public service but that is driven by the need to have what they call colloquially a war chest so mm -hmm. that they can they can buy their office so even when you see the the rise and rise of certain politicians um even maybe looking like a sympathetic um uh, sympathetic, uh, uh, what, what do you call it? Uh, a sympathy, a sympathy, sympathy support. Uh, behind it is a lot of money, a lot of <laughs> money, um, and that money is being dished out to all, including those who are who should know better. You know, so that, that those are some of the challenges. So I think that we need to have a conversation as Kenyans, civil society actors, Kenyan citizens, because the lamentations are always there. In fact, the lamentations begin almost immediately after elections. No sooner have Kenyans voted, Ooh, what have we done? And they <laughs> fail to link, they fail to link their 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 problems uh, to the political choices that they make. And we we have to make them uh, link, uh, make that make that connection as uh, civil society in as far as we can, as far as our money will take us, as far as the resources that we have available to us. We need right. to engage with the citizenry and help them see that they are co-conspirators in their own misfortunes. They are the ones who do it. You go after the same leaders because these leaders are so adept at changing themselves. We've not been able to change leadership at the top. While you have pointed at us being able to change leaders, 70%- The argument I think Daisy would be that we do change these people. No, 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 no. The we 70%, get the next ones, I mean, then, look at the 2002 election. We put in all these nice civil society guys, we put in Kibaki, all these people who had been saying nice things. And the then problem what is happened? not the 70% that we get rid of. Uh -huh. The problem the is the 30% that don't go <laughs> and if you look at them, they, they have been there in perpetuity. Like some of these guys, since independence, they are the same guys. They're, even when their, their forefathers die, they inherit, and they're the same people. So they're the same people, including the generations. So that is where the problem is. The top bit, that uh, bit, because if you look at the characters who have, who have governed us, for oh, since independence, man, right. you can read their names blindfolded. It is them, it is their children, it is their relatives. 
that is where the problem lies because those are the people who have captured the state. So mm -hmm. when you push people into the system, they are the ones who maintain the system and it's it, they, they are the ones who have the stranglehold over the system, they have captured it completely. So when you come into, right. into it, you try to fight it and they're the guys who are at the top, they crush you. So you either are co-opted into it or you become now the 70% that is that is removed. <laughs> that is rotated out. <laughs> and remember, and I want to tell you something, that these people are not just in power. Remember, they hold mm -hmm. power in very, very significant levels, at very significant mm -hmm. levels of governance. They own media, very significant voice of media. Right. They own they own businesses. So they are tentacles. They have a spider web of support that keeps them. Yeah, and so you find that the other players pay obeisance to them because if you come up against them, uh, you you may find yourself uh, your business is shut down, you you know you you are voted out of office. So so it's not as simplistic as we want it to be. So there has to be um, a strategy. I combine a unified strategy towards mm -hmm. it. But what we need is not just to get rid of people. We need accountability mechanisms because yeah. the only the only way integrity and leadership will 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 work is if there are accountability measures. So we see them in established democracies. I mean, look at places like let's let's take Israel for example. You know, you have strongman leaders like Netanyahu, but Netanyahu is facing court case. They they jailed their former prime minister Ehud Olmert. Yeah. You know, in America. The president, the, 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 you know, so the the thing is, when you have strong systems of accountability, and you have leaders willing willing to allow their leaders to be held accountable, because we also have the Muzuetu syndrome, the Mutuetu syndrome. Yeah, but again, so I, that, I, 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 I want to stick with this idea of the strong systems because, um, uh, yeah, Darius, if 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 if, if I may ask, does the 2010 constitution give us those strong systems because it doesn't seem really that it does. We are still rotating the 70% um, as it was before. We still have people who steal and don't get prosecuted. You know, um, uh, if I may give an example, if you look at the, the, the clause that allows us to recall MPs, um, uh, it then says it will be the MPs who will decide how we are going to recall them, which seems to be self-defeating. So is it the case that while the constitution does espouse nice things and says some of the things that we'd want to see accountability to see that in how it sets up government, it doesn't actually provide it? I mean, I think that is um, a sort of the second uh, frame uh, and, and in terms of the role that the 2010 constitution was going to play. Number one, because of course being um, the too much centralization of power and national reality that we have talked about, which of course agenda four pretty much uh, tried to deal with that, bringing in devolution, bringing in uh, some of these safeguards. But the most important thing at that point was we were able to begin to decentralize some of our national reality, not in its entirety, but to a degree, we could say we were able to achieve that. At this level, then uh, the second uh, stage of basically this constitution is what we are talking about, which is, do we have these safeguards and can we uh, basically affect them? They are there uh, in, in terms of the commissions, in terms of the separation of powers, of course. In the terms commissions of aren't working. They're, they don't seem to be acting independently even when we say they're independent. The police they are supposed to be independent by, uh, uh, the question says they are, but they're not acting that way. So again, does the question give with one hand and take with the other? It gives, but I think we need to give, to, to, to come up with a kind of citizenry that are able to eventually take up this power and effect it. Of course, there are different levels and layers within which we are able to do this um, accountability uh, at a national, social, and you know, uh, you know, uh, basically state level. 
And one of the big ones of course, here is um, we can now to deal with, um, let's say, uh, public participation. Article 10, subsection 2, Article 102, Article 221, they all provide a certain degree of ability of the citizenry to be able to check some of these institutions um, and some of the agencies, some of these um, parastatals, some of these processes, some of them being uh, budgetary processes, public participation in some of these policy making. The systems themselves, the commissions themselves are faltering, but I think the fact that they already exist is 50% job done, you know? Mm -hmm. right. The other bit is then to say, um, how do we begin to have a kind of citizenry that you know, will go in there and say, this is what is on paper, this is what the, the, the powers that be, the constitution and all uh, other provisions within uh, our local laws, provide the citizens to be able to do coming in from different consistencies, whether civil society, whether as uh, you know, the academia, from whatever perspective you're coming in, is to look at it as their, their very existence gives us half the job done. Then the other half is now, are we ensuring that we have an active and a well-informed citizenry that is able to understand that? Are we able to have a kind of uh, a citizenry that can affect political and sometimes legal and economic ramifications for those who exist within these commissions, these agencies, these um, parastatals. Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, but... Barbara, Yes. I would like to weigh in on that conversation. I want to agree with Darius. Having uh -huh. them there is 50% of the job done. However, right. let's, look, let's not forget that the, the political class have played a significant role in weakening those institutions, particularly when we see the inaugural leadership of the, the, the institutions was actually very strong. We mm -hmm. remember the Auditor General, he did his job and he did it excellently. And what was the response? He was fought all the way. He was fought from right. the presidency. He was fought. Ethics and anti-corruption, we have seen how that one. Anybody who dares to touch on any, you know, anything to do with our politicians. You remember when they went into parliament and they, they actually exposed the corruption with my leg and everything. And the speaker was threatened with being removed from the seat and so the report was done away with. And so the next strategy was the president now appointing, rewarding political failures, all those who failed in their quest for re-election or election have now been put into these constitutional commissions. And so now they owe, they owe the president, they owe the politi politicians a, a, a duty because remember parliament uh, also uh, approved their appointment. So for me, the weakest link in, in this whole governance discussion of mm. independent commissions is parliament. In fact, parliament, this really the 11th and 12th parliament are possibly the absolute worst worst since independent Kenya. It is a completely rogue and totally bogus institution. They, have a, they are a marionette of the executive. They have not exercised their oversight role. They have not held leadership to account and they have allowed for the weakening of all independent institutions of the constitution including the, the, the police service. I mean, we really need to look at the parliament in, in, in fact, majority, if not all of the problems that we are facing right now, points to a complete failure of right. parliament as an institution. And yeah, that is and, the and that was, I, think, I think that was also pointed out in the BBI judgment. But uh, Monica, if I may bring you in here. I mean, the idea is, I would assume, that when we are setting up things like constitutions, ETC, we are dealing with realities as they exist. So if we bring in a constitution that says, um, this is how we are going to have accountability. We are going to have vetting in parliament. We are going to have um, uh, independent commissions. And they turn out not to be independent. The vetting turns out not to be effective. Is it fair to turn around and say, well, actually the problem is you Kenyans are not insisting on your parliament doing this, or you're not voting in nice and peace who will then do what the constitution says. What's the problem there? What, 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 what do we need to fix? I, I think um, to give credit to our lawyers, 
we have we have managed to put into place good laws to, to handle these things but we are failing on the technical part um this also alludes to what that daria said because first of all the kenya government right now is what i i often refer to as an intellectual vacuum they avoid technical expertise and and intellectual debt like the plague anybody who's got any smarts if you want to serve in Kenya government, you better be very good at hiding the fact that you know what you're doing. And these these technical people are the ones who put together the technical things. Because I can put, I can give an example like public participation. Um, in my field, obviously, infrastructure development projects, there's public participation, what are the environmental impacts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We've, we've put in the consideration of public participation, but we need to say public participation and curating those public views given and acting on them so they are audited how many people say approved etc like i stopped participating those personally because i realized the name modekai ogada would be listed as one of the people who approved the project because once i get into that meeting my name is taken down my signature id etc but what i said is not actually recorded or, or acted upon so these are the small technical things on which we are failing things like being vetted by parliament we must record we must record the views given and air them so that a parliamentarian giving some questionable views on some on something or someone's candidature must be called to account or held to account and it must be public and we must stop this thing of doing competitive you know we do competitive recruitment for various positions then we forward three names to the president no we should not forward three names. Why are we doing that? Why have we wasted public resources on interviewing and getting number one? Then we forward up, up to number five. And, and why I, do you need to forward in the first place? Why, why do you need exactly? <laughs> we even, even, in fact, you're, you're right. We even go beyond why are we forwarding? Then what was the use of the, the vetting committee? So we, we must tackle these, these technical flaws because, because the, the people who are fighting justice are using technicalities. So mm -hmm. people who want to do things straight, we must also refer to our technical minds and be ready to use technical expertise in getting what we need to be uh, what we need to be done. Right. And um, I think that's where we're feeling. Okay, we're coming towards the end uh, uh, of our two hours. It's really flown by. Um, but I really wanted to, before we go, to ask a question about whether institution does need changing, even if not using the BBI function. Are there things in there that we think um, uh, are need changing? Darius, maybe I start with you. In terms of um, the concerns uh, the former CG raised about um, our electoral processes and the legal, uh, the legality, the legal time frame given for ruling, whether to be expanded or shortened, uh, how is that done? In previous cases, we've seen cases solved four years into you know, the term of, of an MP. How do we uh, shorten those legal processes? Of course, that's something we are you know, deliberating on. The other conversation, which of course they're trying to slot in through the BBI, which is uh, how much goes to the counties uh, in terms of uh, the funding for the counties. I think that is a worthy conversation. Might not need a constitutional change, uh, definitely amidst the, the other thing they are raising, but that's a healthy conversation within this um, you know, constitution and, 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 and what it enables. But then also the two that uh, gender conversation, how do we go about um, implementing that? How do we go about ensuring we're able to meet the, uh, that particular provision so that we do not have what is essentially illegal uh, state bodies because of their composition? Yeah, and how would we go about starting off that change without it being captured uh, by the uh, politician? How do we insulate it from political interest? You know, right now, speaking from a political perspective, I think, first of all, it shouldn't be any time within two years of a general election or mm -hmm. even longer. It, it would make for a very good um, uh, process. That would be an amendment you would want put in the constitution that we can't change it within two years of an election. Definitely, I mean, with the succession politics right now, with an economy that is uh, pretty much, uh, you know, a political economy that is malfunctioning, 
and amidst all, uh, basically the conduct of the executive as has been in the last almost six, seven years, I do not think we have would have a healthy, uh, you know, debate and conversation around it and implement it without it falling into the hands of basically this bunch of goons. So, no, okay. not with, not on this end. Yeah. Uh, Mordecai, what do you think? I'm in agreement with what Daria said, said because it points towards that the, the, we, we must put in technical barriers to, to self-interest because political, we've obviously failed to put political and legal barriers because some legal practitioners, especially the better ones in Kenya, all seem to have political interest now. And I'm not sure how, what percentage of the Senate is lawyers, but it's pretty high. Um, and so we must put in technical barriers to political interest, whether in the, the EIS, like I was talking about, or, or, or in, the, in something like what Darius just said, time is time. This is the window, and if it's passed, that's gone. It's like, like now, I think the only thing that's even saving us from serious odium in Kenya is the fact that we put a date for the general election. We didn't even say a year. We put a date, I the second week of August or something. <laughs> That little thread, that little technical thread that maybe no one paid attention to at the time is what might save this country from a serious audience. So I, 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 I think if we go and strengthen the technical arm, the technical arm of government has been extremely weakened. I'm sure there are people in the Attorney General's office who knew that the BBI stuff is flawed, if even I knew. But they were silenced. They are silent. There are people in the Ministry of Wildlife who know that our wildlife policy right now is rubbish, the little of it that's, that's done, but they are silenced. And the, we have a code of silence within government. I can go to education and talk about the CDC. It's now unraveling and blowing up in our faces and we are pretending like what's going on, like we didn't, we hadn't had one day and others say this thing. Right. Telling us what to watch them yeah. In, yeah. yeah, now we are, we are suddenly shocked. So I think <laughs> we must strengthen the technical side of government. And right. then technical, and if you put in things like, security of tenure for technical mm. personnel in government. So he can, right. he can work and give you his best or have uh, best. Mordecai, if, 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 if I may, um, um, uh, Daisy, I'll come back to you for the final word. But um, Mordecai, uh, if you could respond to this uh, question from uh, Abdullahi Halake, um, uh, Boru, who writes for, who's one of our curators here. Um, yeah. uh, he's, he asks whether we are over lawyering um, the country. So uh, pretty much everything, is, we, we act as if every single thing has to be put into the constitution. If you look at the U.S. constitution, it's a very tiny document. Yeah. Okay. Yes. You know, yes. But it seems to hold them in good stead. So is it the case I, that we I, have I, all these details in there? Yeah, yeah. I, th I think Boru has a good point. We, we keep thinking that laws will solve everything. Laws are sort of guidelines, but te technical, technical and ethical considerations have fallen by the wayside at the altar of law. What mm -hmm. is the, what is the law says? And you know this 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 very cryptic um, phrase that is always used. The law is very clear. That means <laughs> exactly the opposite of that. The law is very clear on this both sides. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I, I think we need to dial back a bit on the dependence on lawyers because we've seen on live TV, lawyers let down their poli political principles embarrassingly. <laughs> so we, we must not, even lawyers have their limitations, so there, there are some good ones. So yeah, let's, right. let, let's get back to technical and ethical a bit more and keep <laughs> keep going a bit in check. Um, Daisy, you have the I'm last question. word. What do you think about... Whether anything needs changing in our constitution, what would it be, and how should we go about? It? Well, you know, constitutions are made by human beings, and human beings are not perfect. Constitution is a living document, and so um, it can be changed when need be, and that's why we have provided in the constitution pathways for its amendment. But we must be cautious about bad faith amendments. And while it is true that while the constitution is supposed to provide us with a framework, unfortunately, when you're faced with the kind of leadership that we have in this country, very unfortunate leaders who are led by what Mordecai calls their 
ace interests, mm -hmm. then you need to put everything in the letter of the law. Who would have imagined that you would be faced with a president who would disregard court orders? Who would imagine that we would be faced with a parliament that completely subverts the constitution and the rule of law and the people are left without recourse? Our constitution has actually been overthrown right now by the current leadership at all levels. It really has been overthrown in so many ways. But what we do have is that it remains uh, intact. Um, and so there is hope that we can actually overcome this bad leadership and put in place leaders that will actually lead us in the manner envisioned in the constitution. But having said that, there are some cleanups that need to be done. And I know that a lot of people talk about the two-thirds gender principle as one of the key amendments that we've been seeking. But remember that we, are on, we have only sought an amendment with the, um, uh, for the two-thirds because of the refusal for our parliament to put in place the necessary frameworks within the subsidiary legislation. Because if you look at Article 81, it provides that all those requirements of the two-thirds should be um, legislated in the electoral laws, which they have refused to do. However, when you look at some things like the Senate, the way the two thirds works in the Senate, it's not at its optimum. It provides pure nomination for 16 women, um, assuming that women will not be elected and those women don't get voting rights. So those are some of the things I think that we can look at. But for me, one of the most, uh, uh, the, 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 the amendments we should look at is putting in the constitution the obligations of the presidency on things like um, court orders, you know, not leaving any room. And this is with hindsight, with what we've been faced, because who's to say a few years down the line, we wouldn't get another presidency like this one, where mm -hmm. he would seek to really overthrow the constitutional order, you know, and, and essentially rule by fiat. So for me, I think those are some of the things that we should look like look at just the way um, uh, Mordecai has said, uh, you know, that, that, that little uh, note there about when we hold our elections, actually giving them a date and time and mm -hmm. putting an end to term, you know, to, the, to giving uh, the limits of the terms and when elections must be held. Those are the kind of things that we want. So those are really just technical stuff, not major overhauls. For the most part, what we need right now is full implementation of the constitution. Even additional funds to the counties can be done within the context of the current constitution because 15% is only a minimum level. It's the floor. It doesn't say that you cannot provide more than 15%. So I do think that for now, we shouldn't even be having a, a, a discussion around any amendments because we've seen the total bad faith that we have with current uh, mm -hmm. leadership. And you know, it, it's important that we do things within context. It is not safe for the country and for future generations to contemplate constitutional amendments. Any constitutional amendment that would require a referendum or that would significantly open up the constitution should not be done under the current leadership. Mm -hmm. And we lose nothing by not amending our constitution because the constitution 2010 is a good document. It right. may have its weaknesses and certain limitations, but those limitations are not fatal. So mm -hmm. I do think that by rejecting BBI, by rejecting any constitutional amendments under the current leadership, the country remains stood on good stead. We have a very good constitution that can take us into the future very safely and what we need to concentrate on right now as Kenyans is how to ensure that we sweep away the entire current leadership. It is obsolete. It is not fit for purpose. It is not fit for Kenya's future. We right. must change our leadership and that mm -hmm. should be our urgent business as Kenyans. All right, thanks a lot, Daisy. Um, uh, Daisy, I'm Danny. Um, uh, Dr. Mordecai Ogada, Daria Sokola, really thanks a lot for a fantastic um, uh, discussion. Um, uh, and, and, and thanks to HPF, uh, the Heinrich Ball Foundation, for helping the elephant put this up. Um, uh, as I have said uh, at the beginning, 
um, this is part of a series that we've been doing on the BBI and the effect of the BBI judgment. Um, uh, we have another uh, installment in the series on the 12th, um, uh, on Thursday, the 12th of August, um, uh, which we will let you guys know about. And the recordings of this and the previous series that we've done um, uh, uh, will be available or are already available on um, uh, the Elephant website. That's www.theelephant.info, where you will also find quite a lot of content um, uh, uh, that, that, that we've published um, on this subject, um, uh, if you're interested. And, and always feel free to get it. Um, uh, if you go to the website, you'll see um, uh, uh, our contacts and ways of doing that. So anyway, many thanks to our panelists. Many thanks to everybody who participated, for all of you who listened in. And I hope I will see you guys in two weeks' time.